Good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Harrison. Welcome to another Sponsorship Bets virtual series. Really excited today to dive into a whole new aspects of the sports business. It's really growing at a remarkable pace, and that's the, the world of sports betting. And today, we're going to talk about some of the innovations, the engagement opportunities that exist. We're going to do two panels today, uh, each of them about a half an hour, and then we're going to take the last 30 minutes and field all your questions. So fire them away at us. We'll have all of our panelists. So I'd like to welcome our first group of panelists here this morning. It's featuring David Van Eggman, the founder and CEO of Better Capital. Brian Bennett, the Chief Operating Officer at Betfred USA Sports. Kelly Walker, VP Growth at FanDuel. And Matthew Holt is the CEO of US Integrity. Good morning. Do we have morning. Our, morning. Oh, there's Matthew. There you are. Good morning. How's everybody doing? How's the Masters right, going? <laughs> Looks like we've got some golf fans here. Is it still in a rain delay or do we know? Last time I checked, it was still in a rain delay. Nobody had made it through more than one hole. Well, uh, to your point earlier in our in our pre pre chat, maybe we'll, we'll pick up a couple million viewers. Yep. We'd love for you to just introduce yourself to our audience and tell them a little bit about what you do and, and your background. And the best thing about this panel is, I'm a strange. You, the four of you all know each other, so I'm I'm a stranger to, to this group. Uh, Brian. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Bennett. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Betfred USA Sports. Uh, Betfred is a UK-based uh, sports betting company, been around since the 60s. Uh, we are uh, owned by a guy named Fred, uh, so owned by Fred Doan and his brother Peter. Uh, entered the U.S. space uh, around a year ago, and uh, I'm responsible for all operations. Uh, we currently have two open sports books in Iowa and Colorado, and we're preparing to open our third one in Pennsylvania uh, next week, the week after. Great. Thanks for being here. And David. Thanks, Mark. Dave Van Eggman. I'm the founder and CEO of Better Capital, an investment and consulting platform focused on the U.S. online gaming market opportunity across sports and casino. Have spent five plus years as an executive in the industry, was at FanDuel as head of strategy, so have a few former colleagues and friends on, on the call. And then most recently at Barstool Sports as head of strategy, helping them monetize the, the betting space. Amazing. And Matthew, welcome. Hi, Matthew Holt. I'm the uh, former chief operating officer at a company called Canner Gaming. We launched the first regulated mobile sports betting app in the United States uh, early 2018. I founded my own company called U.S. Integrity with some private funding. And we work, uh, we're a game integrity, fraud prevention, sports betting compliance firm that works with the likes of Betfred, William Hill, most of the larger operators, regulators in 18 states, NBA, Pac-12, Big 12, SEC, major universities like Pittsburgh, Penn State, Colorado, Tennessee, uh, Las Vegas Lights here locally even delve into the soccer a bit. Uh, um, so thanks for having us. Matthew, I'm going to get you to kick it off. And, and as you know, and the whole group knows that since the Supreme Court's decision two years ago that, you know, has radically changed this industry. But now, you know, somewhere in the range, I think 25 states have approved betting on its way to 40. Tell us a little bit about how sports betting has expanded in the United States over the last couple of years. So I don't think anybody would have thought 30 months in that we would have over 20 states already with regulated sports betting. And I think the the speed in which some of these states have got up and launched and regulations passed has been amazing. Um, what, what's really interesting is that each and every state tends to cater to its constituents. There's not this one singular model that works across the United States. In Mississippi, which was one of the early adopters, they don't have mobile sports betting, but they put it into effect to cater to the brick and mortar casinos in Mississippi. But you also have states like Tennessee that literally have zero brick and mortar presence that are 100% online and, and then everyone in between. And it's just been amazing to see the evolution of sports betting and the emergence and the, and the convergence of everyone for one united reason to make the industry better, the leagues, the regulators, the operators. I mean, that's rework with all of them. And I, and I could say that they all work together. And I think that's what's made this process work. That's why so many of these states are able to get launched, get regs passed, is the fact that everyone's come together 
uh, for the betterment of the industry. And I think that's why the industry is moving so much faster than people may have anticipated three or four years ago. Can you talk a little bit about this intersection of, of live sports and sports betting? And why is it, you know, when you think about the current engagement, I mean, years ago, it was, you could only maybe make a futures bet or a prop bet, but now you've got eye gaming and, 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 and little, in, you know, in event gaming and, and real time gaming. And maybe talk a little bit about this, this intersection. I'd love all four of you to, to tackle that. Yeah, I think it's a really exciting time in the sports industry in general. I think Kelly mentioned it's a huge, huge engagement driver, especially in a world where we don't see fans in the stands today. It's another way for fans to engage with the game, maybe watch and engage with games that they otherwise wouldn't as a Thursday night football or a, a Tuesday night basketball game. Is that something that the average fan is interested if their team isn't playing? Betting provides a, a hook into that to, to either watch a game or, or watch the game longer if the game is a blowout. So I think it's a really exciting time in the industry because it, it's such an engagement driver for everyone, particularly in the current times that we're in. Awesome. And I want to just thank our audience for all the technical uh, suggestions coming in fast and fierce. We are working on Kelly and hope to get her back, at least her voice. So we will do that. Brian, your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I'll just echo kind of what everyone else has said. I mean, I think case in point was last night, right? There were <clears throat> there were three Mac games on. I don't watch the Mac normally, uh, but I watched it last night. Um, and there was two really, really good games. And I think that's, uh, you know, I think a big reason why the Mac has put those games on Tuesdays and Wednesdays is because they know there's going to be audience. And there's no, there's going to be audience, especially in states where, uh, where gambling is legal and sports betting is legal because, you know, now that people have a, a vested interest in watching uh, Western Michigan come back against Toledo. So I think that's the, the sort of engagement drivers that, that sports betting can add. And then I also add that, you know, really in play is something that I think you're, you know, it's, it's a little bit new for people in the United States, but in Europe, it's been, it's been around for a while. And that's betting, you know, while the game is, is in play on various different things, not just the outcome, but uh, you know, various player props and things like that. And in the UK um, it's uh, you know, over 80% of volume is on in play betting, not pre-match betting. So, I think you're going to see that you're already seeing that in New Jersey as well. And you're going to see that across um, every state that legalizes this when it comes to online. Well, Matthew, speaking of the Matt, I know that you've got a, a neat program that you launched with uh, Ohio University there, go Bobcats. Um, and hopefully we'll have time to chat about that a little bit uh, uh, later. I, I had a chance to be a part-time professor there three years and I back-to-back Canadian quarterback. So a little bias here, but so I do watch the Mac, but I love maybe your thoughts and, and your comments around this you know, the, the live sports experience and how sports betting has really kind of just blown up with it. I mean, there were plenty of studies prior to the repeal of PASPA that showed that people that wagered on a game or had some financial incentive on that game were eight to 10 times more likely to watch that game than somebody who didn't have action on that game. But what I think people may have even underestimated a bit is the social experience and the social engagement that comes along with the sports betting part. You know, the idea that you can talk with your friends and chat or be on Twitter and people are talking about the, you know, the game, the odds, the props throughout the entirety of the game. And even if you're not actually betting the idea of, oh, I might want to bet here, or I might want to bet here. What do you think I should do? Is this a good time to bet? Allow someone to be engaged with this community and be a part of something, which right now is really exciting, really fast paced. So I, I think the social engagement part of it, especially at a time during COVID, where everybody's stuck in their houses, uh, the ability to, to, to be in, involved in some big community that's really excited and having fun is also driving more engagement to sports betting as well. David, I'd love to get your perspective on kind of the, the, the size of the market. You know, as Matthew mentioned, who would imagine that there'd be 25 states already betting? You know, prior to this new legislation, you know, I guess my question in simple terms, are we going to become, say, a UK market, or are we going to become like an Australia market where you really got, uh, you know, a high amount of betting per capita? What, what are your thoughts on that? What are the opportunities that you're seeing around sports betting? Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be bigger than both. I'm, I'm really? putting my career on it, uh, no pun intended, starting, starting a business and investing solely in this space. It's an industry that has so much room for growth. There, there are 25 states, but there's less than 10 states where you can sign up and make sports bets from the comforts of your couch through a mobile application today. I think we need to see 
more states do that. It, it's about a $2 billion market across sports betting and casino today. And I think it gets to a 50 plus billion dollar market at maturity when you look at a majority of states have mobile, fully mobile sports betting in the United States, as well as hopefully 10, 15 plus states have online casino gaming because you've seen at, the, at this intersection of sports and gaming, you see someone's watching the game, then they go play a hand of blackjack. The, the whole gambling ecosystem is essentially moving online. And it's really the last industry to do that. We all know what happened to Blockbuster with Netflix and what Amazon's done to a lot of other businesses. But the gambling industry, the betting industry is the last to move uh, online. And I think it's a huge, huge opportunity and huge dollars will be spent over the next 10 to 20 years in this market. Yeah, awesome. I mean, an interesting point that, that that it used to be go to Vegas, go to the sports book, place your bet, maybe go to the casino. And now, um, I, and just maybe a follow-up question from my end. So as you talked about it, it's kind of interesting that in some of these new states, they're, they're literally, if I can, if you allow me the skipping bricks and mortar and going right to e-commerce, uh, you know, you made that comment with the last in, but you seem to be very bullish on the growth. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, t- Tennessee, as Matt mentioned, just launched and it solely launched online, I think we see exponentially higher growth in New Jersey, which has had mobile sports betting for over two years now, 90% of the wagers are placed online. It's This business is not about a destination to go somewhere. Those experiences are great, but people want to engage every day when it's matching on Wednesday night, they're not driving an hour to their local casino to place a bet. They want to log on their phone five minutes before the game and make a wager. And then when it's halftime and their, their wager may be going the wrong way, they want to double down or hedge on the other team. It, it is an always on engagement and the mobile opportunity once it be, proliferates across the United States with good positive legislation. I believe the market can be significant multiples of the size it is today. So uh, I'm going to throw it over to you, Brian. Um, you have probably answered the question you get every day, which is, is there a guy named Fred? There is. There is a guy named Fred. Still our CEO, still still manages the company every day. Awesome. Give us some more perspective. We're, we're looking at, obviously, uh, and David talked about it, you know, the, Europe and the UK is a much more uh, established, mature uh, betting market. And obviously, you came, um, Betfred came to the US in 2019 to kick things off. Are you seeing engagement here? Is it going to be the same? Is it going to be different? What, are you, what is your perspective? Um, I mean, I think it, ultimately for the market itself, I think it's going to be the same, <clears throat> the same eventually. I mean, you know, per David's comment about, you know, as long as the legislation cooperates, um, you know, the New Jersey and Colorado have passed you know, almost identical legislation and it's fantastic. Um, it's low barrier to entry, low licensing rates, low tax rates, open mobile registration, that, that is the way to go. And that's what's going to really drive the market. You have certain states. Um, we have a casino in Iowa, which still has in-person registration. Nevada is the same. So you actually have to go down to the casino. You have to show your ID. You have to go through, you know, sort of that process in person before you can actually activate your account. And that, you know, by its very nature, really throttles uh, the growth and really throttles competition because you're really only able to target customers that live within a you know, let's call it an hour drive of your the casino you're in. So, uh, and you see that in Iowa, right? Every in Iowa, all the sports betting um, sports betters are really kind of compartmentalized based on where their nearest casino is. On January first, that changes, and Iowa go, goes full open mobile registration. That's going to massively change the market. Um, it's going to allow us, who in the, we're in the northwest corner of Iowa, it's going to allow us to target Cedar Rapids, uh, Des Moines, uh, where a lot of that market share is, and I think it's going to uh, significantly change the landscape of, of the competition in Iowa. So I do think, you know, ultimately the U.S. is going to go in that direction. It's just because of the state by state, highly fragmented nature, it's probably just going to take a little bit longer. Gotcha. And now you question my part, but in the U.K., is it more universal across the country? Yeah, U.K., there's there's one gaming commission. You have one licensing. Uh, the U.K. Uh, GC manages uh, uh, casino and sports betting across the entire U.K., so everything is completely ubiquitous. Uh, in the U.S., obviously, it's 50 different states, 50 different regulations, and even different when you get into tribal gaming, uh, every tribe has its own gaming commission. So uh, Matt, Matthew can probably tell me the, the exact number, but there's something like you know, 400 different gaming uh, jurisdictions where you have to get licensing and different, different approvals on products. And 
it's it, the U.S. is a highly fragmented space. Um, that's the reason a lot of European companies that come over struggle for a little bit when they first come because it, they're not used to the regulatory environment uh, of the United States. Matt, not to put you on the spot, do you have the number on the tip of your tongue? Yeah, 264 uh, different gaming jurisdictions within the United States. And to Brian's point, most of those tribal. Look at a state like Washington State, who just passed a bill and is probably going to launch in uh, Q1 2021. Uh, they have 29 different casinos operated by 24 different tribes. So within one state itself, you actually have 24 different jurisdictions and you have to get licensed in each. Each one uh, negotiates their own compacts and their their own set of rules. So it's not just the 50 states with each tribe being able to negotiate their own compacts as well. Essentially, we have 264 different gaming jurisdictions in the United States. And that, that's the, sorry, that's just that's the very reason why Betfred set up Betfred USA. And we're a wholly owned subsidiary, but we're completely autonomous to run the US business um, as needed, just because we're used to that that way of doing business. Our our uh, uh, compatriots in the UK are not, are not are not necessarily used to that. Well, and, and Mark, I think the, I think the more important point on this, uh, about aside from the jurisdictions, is it's going to be complicated. Um, right. Unfortunately, there there's no reason California shouldn't have sports betting, but there's a lot of constituents there, and, and it should have mobile sports betting, just like a big state like New Jersey. But as you see in all these states, these are complicated issues with. Uh, really entrenched constituents. And so it, it will take a long time to get the, these markets open and the market size. But once they do, it's a safer environment for the consumers. It's a regulated environment. Payments are secure and known because it's not like people aren't betting in California where there's a, a lot of tribes and other constituents who um, are in there and, and have casinos there. So hopefully uh, over the years, we'll see more legislation and bring this market into the light and into a regulated environment that's safe for all customers. David, you kind of read my mind because I was going to throw a question to you at how do you talk to the investment community about this complexity? Um, and I think you just started started the answer there by, by, by that, but maybe you can just finish, finish that question for me. Yeah, I, I tell them patience. Uh, it's not going to be a $50 billion market next year. It, it may not even be in 10 years. And most investors tell me, well, that's that's too long of a horizon. I say, well, you, ju you just have to look a little longer because we don't know. It will be controlled by state level politics when these markets open up. Uh, but I have an extremely high degree of confidence that the markets will be as big as I expect and as other more bullish industry experts expect. Once we do get legalization, it's just anyone's best guess on the time frame for that. But but once we do, this will be a significant advertising category. This will have significant ramifications across the broader sports ecosystem once you do see more legislation. Brian, just going back to you, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about innovation as it relates to consumer facing technology in, uh, in sports betting and how that impacts user engagement. Really, how does a sports book today, how are you gonna stand out uh, a couple of different reasons, I mean, a couple of ways. I mean, I think it really starts at the top of the funnel with marketing. Um, you know, you look at you look at states like like Colorado, where you know there's six million people, and there will eventually be 30 online licensees doing business for those six million people. I think there's like 13 or 14 now. Um, and right now, you go into Colorado, and you're probably beaten over the head a little bit with sports betting companies, right? Everyone had their everything from wrapped buildings, wrapped trains to TV, radio, online, everything. So. Um, you know, marketing is obviously going to keep part of it. Um, we did a deal with the Denver Broncos uh, to, to help kind of cut through that clutter um, as a company like Betfred coming into the market for the first time in the U.S. for the first time, where a lot of people don't know who we are. Everyone, all of sports bettors probably know who FanDuel and DraftKings and, and BetMGM and those guys are. Um, for Betfred, we're a little bit new. So we knew we needed some sh to build that street cred instantaneously. And for us, that was kind of tying our brand to the Denver Broncos. Uh, which which helped us sort of immediately put ourselves at the top right, into the mix when when people are choosing a, bet, uh, a sports betting company, and then from there you know our mantra even in the UK has always been to provide the best value to to the better, and that can come from bonuses that can come from boosts where you're boosting the odds or boosting the prices on certain things. We boost a lot of stuff on Bronco games to get people to make those wagers and, and take a chance, mm -hmm. and uh, and it's uh, you know it comes to giving people the best prices. You know people there are certain companies that will gouge gouge betters a little bit when it comes to odds pricing and it's it's not you know the the uh 
the casual better might not notice, but the, the astute better will. And Fred's mantra has always been provide the best value for the, for the punter and don't, uh, don't try to, you know, kind of game people. So that's what we're trying to do. And we think that provides the best, the best user experience. And we think people will stick around as a result. Okay. I need some odds from you three on, on whether or not, if I go back to Kelly, whether we can, we can get her. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's do some live webinar odds here. I'm Kelly, I'm going to try. Plus 500 at this point. We'll see. <laughs> okay, here we are. Plus 500. Kelly, uh, I'm feeling your pain. Are you there? She's not there. Okay, we'll try to get her back for the Q&A and worst case scenario, we'll have her maybe answer some of her, some of the questions in the chat. I'm gonna to go to you, David, and talk, get you to talk a little bit about the kind of the supply chain as it works with, you know, uh, Brian briefly mentioned advertising opportunities, but you're seeing media, he talked about the Broncos, pro sports teams, media personalities. Um, you know, tell us about that ecosystem, that supply chain that's really growing rapidly right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, it harkens me back to my experience at Barstool Sports, one of the most popular digital sports media companies in the U.S. And th they took a really sophisticated approach around the sports betting market. They said, hey, we don't want to take advertising dollars like we do with Anheuser-Busch and with the Cash App and with all these major categories where you typically have advertising relationships around great digital content. And they said, hey, we can do more in sports betting. We can go deeper. We can license our IP, do a really deep exclusive uh, marketing deal and, and really be the brand for mm -hmm. someone around a, a sports betting business. So we actually did a, um, an IP licensing marketing agreement and had Penn National Gaming, a publicly listed casino company in the US, buy in a major stake into Barstool Sports um, to partner around the sports betting business. And they recently launched the Barstool Sportsbook. And I think you're seeing more media companies partner in this space, maybe not to the same extent, but all the major media companies now in the U.S., with the exception of Sinclair, ESPN, CBS, Fox, uh, NBC Sports, they all have large partnerships with sports right. betting operators to grow this ecosystem. And, and the leagues and teams are, are in the game as well and starting to partner, whether it's on the data side or the sponsorship side. So all the constituents in the ecosystem are really benefiting from this. And I think everyone's all in to grow the industry, which is phenomenal. I've read, and I'd love your, your thought on this, that it can cost up to $500 to get a, a, a new, new customer in sports betting, which seems extremely high in this world of customer acquisition. Is that number off base? What, what are your thoughts on that? No, it, it's, it's not off base. Um, but thankfully the returns are really high. It, it's a great business and, and companies are making good ROI on that investment. It's, it's a heavily competitive space though. Um, and so customer acquisition costs are high. I think the more it proliferates though, the, the cost of customer acquisition will actually go down. What's hard in this digital world with national TV is sports betting's only in New Jersey. So if you're buying a TV advertisement, there's millions of people in New York City who are seeing your TV advertisement who can't actually act on it. And, and that's a shame. So hopefully states like New York will have mobile sports betting, and then the, the cost per customer acquisition will actually go down because your media will work harder since some states' customers can't, just can't engage in this activity yet. And it is state-specific, Mark. They, uh, I think in New Jersey, it actually goes as high as eight dollars $900 for, uh, wow. just because it's a, it's a lot more uh, mature. But in Colorado, where it's just launched, it's, a, it's significantly lower. So it really is state-specific. Yeah, it's very interesting how this to your point earlier, it's a patchwork of regulation and also marketing opportunity and cost. And Matthew, when you think about um, commercial opportunities, um, uh, I'm just going to check one more time. Somebody's suggesting that Kelly is there. Kelly, you there? Okay, we'll get you into q and I am, I am here, if you can hear me. I can hear you. Hooray, we're all doing a standing position. At least I am, because I'm at my Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> So, Kelly, what have you thought of the discussion so far? <laughs> <laughs> well, from what I've been able to hear, it sounds very lively. I wish, wish I could have participated. <laughs> um, I'm going to throw one question at you and then uh, a final one to Matthew and then hope to have you back, Kelly, for our, our Q&A. Um, but, you know, I had asked Brian this question, which I had also wanted to ask you, which is, you know, when it comes to innovation in terms of consumer-facing technologies, how, how do you stand out? How do, how do different sports book operators differentiate themselves? Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely getting more crowded, obviously. And I, you know, 
it, it's probably a bit ironic to answer this question this way because I think Brian um, was thinking about it similarly, but with FanDuel, we're really trying to differentiate ourselves by, by being what we call absurdly fan focused. And we bring that to life through the partners we work with, the products, the promotions, et cetera. So like despite being the house, we don't want an adversarial relationship with our customers at all. You know, we have fun and enjoy when they win, even if that's costing us money. Um, and we take that trust with our customers and partners very seriously. So we continue to invest there. I think a, a prime example of this is a promotion mechanic we created that we call spread the love, where the spread actually moves in favor of folks as they bet, so as more people bet, the spread moves more. And we've actually moved spreads on games over 100 points in favor of fans before. Um, wow. And at that point, it's, it's really just us giving money away. And you'll see it pop up on Twitter, people being like, has FanDuel lost their minds? And we're like, no, like this is for you guys. We want you guys to have fun and, and enjoy it. And we expect and see that that you know, returns dividends whenever uh, it comes to loyalty and engagement with our products. I love that expression of you want to celebrate with your customers. Yeah. And Matthew, yeah. just having, uh, and I throw it to you to kind of close out our first session this panel is, when you think about commercial opportunities and engagement, what do you see happening next, both the United States and worldwide? What, what trends or predictions do you see coming up next? Well, if you think of the, the numbers that the AGA and some really credible organizations used to throw around and still do, that the sports betting marketplace, both legal and illegal in the United States, was around $500 billion. And, and mm -hmm. we're not even up to 10% of that in the United States yet. So what is the main goal here of us as regulators, operators, leagues, teams? It's to move people from the illegal, unregulated market into the regulated legal market. And there's a lot of different different ways to do that. And that provides a lot of different opportunity. And one of the ways we do it is through the best legislation and regulation possible, the sharing of data, transparency, which allows regulators to do faster customer dispute resolution, handle issues quicker for the customers, make the experience holistically better for everyone. Thus, right. people are more likely to wager in the legal marketplace. And then once they are participating in the legal marketplace, then there's so many opportunities. Everyone talks about taking bets or making bets, but there's marketing, there's promotions, there, you know, there's compliance firms like ours, there's geolocation services, there's data distribution. There are so many ancillary services and ways to, to be successful uh, in the sports betting industry other than taking or making bets that but the first goal always has to be how do we transition all these people from the illegal market into the legal regulated um, betting marketplace. Amazing so thank you very much to the four of you I'm going to ask all of you to come back for our q and I think we're going to talk more about that that transition and uh, so I appreciate your time here and we'll check back in in about 30 minutes. Thanks Mark. Thanks you. So next up, uh, really excited to have the Head of Sports Partnerships from Verizon Media, Media and Yahoo Sports, Ishwara Gosman Shrine, uh, who I did a sponsorship ex all access with recently. From the NBA, heading up their fantasy and gaming, uh, Scott Kaufman Ross, uh, Chief Commercial Officer of the Action Network, Network Ari Berard, and Matt Prigo, Matt is the Chief Marketing Officer of Bet MGM. So let's see how we're doing here. Are we, we four for four? Do we have all of you? Amazing. How's everybody doing today? How's everybody's internet? Maybe that's what the only question I should ask. I think so. So far, so good. We'll I'll find good. out. Yeah. Well, and we've also got a nice, a nice game uh, backdrop flex going here. So uh, I uh, got a master's theme. All right. If you can just move your head to the left, we can. We can. Uh, there he is. Yeah. There's Tiger. Scott, what's going on behind you there? This is our uh, NBA Finals bubble setup. All right, love it. I'm in the Bellagio, uh, if that matters. Uh, this is the wallpaper. I'm in the Bellagio, so that uh, I, I have somewhat of a gaming theme. Yeah, for our, I'm not gonna ask. Last time you and I talked to Farah, you were outside, so. Um, yeah, uh, I've had to move to the basement. It's raining today, so. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know Less either. glamorous, but. Um, but you know what, Ishwara, I'd love for each of the four of you to introduce yourselves. I'm gonna ask you to, to start off, and then I'll go to uh, Ari, Matt, and Scott and uh, love to hear your quick intro background, what you do, and, and just tell a little bit about yourselves to the audience. 
Sure, I'm Ashwara. I lead uh, partnerships and business development for Yahoo Sports, which is a division of Verizon. Um, so lead our relationships with many of our friends on the call. So um, Verizon is proud. We have relationships with all four major leagues, with MGM in the gaming space. Um, thank you for having me. Began my career in consulting and management, uh, management consulting and banking and the sports agency side. Awesome. Matt? Uh, so Matt Prevo, I run all the uh, commercial functions functions at BetMGM, have the good fortune of being partnered with all the other panelists. Um, prior to BetMGM, I was previously in the UK where I was Chief Marketing Officer of Coral, which is a large betting brand in, uh, in the UK, actually based in Gibraltar um, during that time, and started my career in combination of management, consulting, and private equity. Nice. And, um, and I'm Scott, I'm the head of fantasy and gaming at the NBA. I've been at the NBA for nine years, uh, started my career uh, at Goldman Sachs, and then I worked in our strategy group for five years, um, starting to focus on this category when our commissioner wrote the op-ed in the New York Times that changed the NBA's position on it, and then uh, split out to, to start a group uh, about three years ago, um, once the category kind of came into clear focus. So my group focuses on our, uh, our partnerships with sports betting companies. We've also had an opportunity to work with everyone on this call, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and also helping set the strategy for sports betting for the NBA. Betting hits a number of our different areas, you know, our teams, our, our broadcast partners, um, making sure you know, certain integrity and security issues. So I, I help educate folks across the organization about sports betting, both the opportunities and the challenges. All right, Ari's got a new new sponsor, so uh, a new microphone sponsor. So we're gonna go back to him and see how how the new mic's working. Is this better? Oh my gosh, it's amazing! I, I right. just closed my eyes, and you could give a sermon from the mountain now. Ari Vorod, Chief Commercial Officer of the Action Network, we're a digital media platform focusing exclusively on sports betting. Uh, I'm responsible for all our revenue driving initiatives, as well as our partnerships with leagues, teams, and media companies. So I've worked in sports books primarily through our affiliate business. So I've worked with, all, all, I work regularly with all three of the other panelists. And, and prior to that, I was at FanDuel. Um, so I've worked with Scott for many years there, and as well as uh, Dave who you and Kelly, who just left uh, the previous panel. Yeah, well, while I've got you, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the use of insights and analytics to really enhance the betting, betting experience. Sure. So, so action is, is really two things, if you think of it. We're a, a digital media content platform in that we provide news and information, skew, taking a betting angle to it. And we're also very much a product and tech company. And so we use um, you know, millions of data points and tons of historical data going back 20 years across every game to essentially provide our users with the information they need to know to make the most confident and educated bet that they can make today. And is it, we think that, that betting in a lot of ways is the most, one of the most interesting ways to cover and analyze sporting events because for years you talked about who's going to win the game today? Is it going to be the Giants or is it going to be the Eagles? Well, Matt's company over at BetMGM is not only do they think the Eagles are going to win, they're willing to put their, their the company's own money to the extent that, that they can. So the odds, we're going to favor the odds on the Eagles. If you disagree with us, bet on the Giants and we'll pay you double your money if you do it. Like there, there's no real more confident conviction and, and, and to have more conviction than that. And so what, what action does is really, analyze everything that's happening in the sporting world. How does a team perform when they're on the road, playing at night against a spread that's more than seven and really helping take super complicated information, distill it down and say, look, our experts think you should back the Giants this weekend. I don't know if that's what they're actually saying this weekend. And certainly I don't think they're going to say that on the money line, but, but that's the kind of thing we do. Take something super broad, distill it down and, and, and sort of disseminate in a very simple and straightforward way. Well, uh, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about how you serve customers, serve them what they want, how do you apply that to content, and uh, you know, I know you've got a lot of different platforms. Yeah, sure. So for us, it's all about serving the customers what they want. It, it started for us a lot before gaming became legal in the U.S. You know, we have every live national and local NFL game available on Yahoo Sports. We work with Scott to have League Pass games from the NBA available on our platform. 
We have highlights also from MLB and the NHL, which NHL being a new deal we just recently closed. We have original content, so you can tune in and listen to our experts tell you maybe who's going to win the Giants game this weekend. Um, we also have data, scores, schedules, statistics. Um, we have commerce. You can buy t-shirts, and you used to be able to buy tickets with us. Um, but for us, it really, the heart of Yahoo Sports is really our fantasy audience. We, you know, that is what Yahoo Sports is perhaps best known for, including very well in Canada. So for us, the new thing we're really working on that we worked with both MGM and the NBA on is this new product sort of, I think Scott coined it sort of not a watch and bet, but a little bit of a bet and watch product. So you'll see us launch in a few weeks. Um, our product engineering team was none too excited that the NBA started a little earlier because now they have a lot of work to do um, for December 22nd but I know the rest of us are excited. We are gonna be launching a product so that if you bet on a game with us and with MGM, you can watch the game on Yahoo Sports, courtesy of the NBA. We all know that fans enjoy betting when they can watch the game. Um, you know, let's have a quick look at, uh, I know you, you shared with us, uh, love to have a quick look at your reel and some of the different platforms you guys have. Are you kidding me? Kaiser, and this is the bandwagon. I hate your pick. I hate your pick. Welcome to Dog Bay. We talk a little bit of the NBA. You're not going to win me on the cool factor between Tiger Woods and Michael freaking George. <laughs> I'm a point guard. You're a point guard, huh? God. <laughs> I'm Patrick Mahomes. Yahoo Sports is the voice of the fans, and I know a great voice when I hear one. <laughs> Are you a $40 million quarterback? You tell me. The Yahoo Sports pregame show. Woo woo. Let's get it. I'm on a yacht. With Greg Olson. You can't spell Gardner without danger. In fact, look it up. Yo, I'm kicking it here with Captain Buffalo. What's happening? Oh, yeah, I'm home. Yeah! I'm getting it for $23? The hell yeah! 30 seconds for you to make as many shots as possible. While I ask you questions and you try not to embarrass yourself, ready to play? I'm going for the top spot. Welcome to Mad Bets, Yahoo Sports weekly gambling show. And I'm excited, man. We just partnered with MGM. We are a one-stop shop. You can watch the game, read articles, and you can watch this show and then place your bet on the app. There's no game I'm not betting on. I want, I want action in every game. Every time people go, ah, I want to go yes and no. We don't want to see a bunch of good teams. We want to see a great team. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Scott, you made the comment about going from management consultant to reading an op-ed. Now you're in charge of engaging with fans in a whole new way. Can you tell us how the NBA does that? Sure. Um, well, listen, you know, we, we've we always believed that we want to meet the fans where they are. Um, and we want to engage our fans how they want to be engaged. And it's clear that a lot of our fans are choosing sports betting as a mechanism to engage with our product. And so... We want to make sure that we're offering them the types of experiences that do that. And, you know, I think from a content perspective, this is a larger initiative that we have at the organization right now. And I think our, our senior leadership team has a belief that, you know, the game telecast hasn't really evolved in, in 30 years. You know, if you look at a broadcast of a game, it's actually alarmingly similar to, to, to what, it, what it is today. And so we are really starting, how do we innovate around the game telecast and how do we do things a little bit differently? And ironically, the, the restart and having to play our games in a bubble actually helped us in this area um, because we didn't have fans in the stands. And so we were forced to really try things differently. So we had um, different camera angles. We, you know, we had the rail cam that kind of went along the baseline where you got to see uh, very different angles of action. And you know, there's generally fans there. So that's not something we had historically been able to experiment with. Right. You know, I'm sure you all saw the virtual fan board where we got to see fan reactions in real time and you could watch the game with an NBA legend and interact and be seen and heard in the arena. That was a very innovative experience. And another category for us is how do we create you know, more personalized broadcasts for our fans? You know, right now and historically you have one telecast that everyone watches even though different fans are watching for different reasons and care mm -hmm. about different things. You know, ESPN for many years has had their mega cast for the college football national championship game where there's very different streams of the games. We think there's a lot of uh, a future in, in that type of experience and that we'll see more segmented, more tailored, more personalized telecasts. So a, a focus for us during the restart was how do we create sort of themed segmented telecasts to bring those types of fans a little bit closer to the game. So we had various different 
influencer telecast and different graphics packages as part of those. And sort of an obvious fan segmentation there is sports betting. Um, and we know that there are fans that are engaging, again, watching our games through the lens of sports betting. So how do we serve them up a telecast that is focused on that? You know, and I think what Ishwara and Matt are working on on Yahoo's platform, again, very focused on that. How do they bring the Yahoo and MGM experience to fans on their platforms? You know, it's a little bit different from what we do at the NBA. We, we serve a little bit of a different role with our fans. But what we did during the restart was we created, we called it NBA Bet Stream, um, where we created a betting focused telecast. And ironically, and, and this was not on purpose, um, all three panelists, uh, their companies were involved. Uh, mm -hmm. We had um, both Yahoo Sports and Action Network provide some of their talent as the alternate commentary, speaking about the game specifically from a betting perspective, right. and graphics that focused on it. And we had MGM as the sponsor of it, prevent, presenting live odds and opportunities throughout. So I think we actually have a, a clip or two of that for everyone. It, it's short, and but you, you'll be able to kind of see how we brought everyone into this and, and, and what the experience looks like from a betting perspective. Let's have a quick look at your bet screen. Okay, I finally can get a plus number on the Pelicans money line. Nope, drop back down to 106. I need a little bit more to get the Pelicans. I want the Pelicans money line. That's where I want. I don't want to trust them. I don't want to be sweating free throws at the end of the game with this Pelicans team. <laughs> so, you know, Matt, Scott talked about partners, and, and I'd love maybe to throw over to you and talk about it. You've got an incredible lineup of partnerships with teams and leagues and media. And can you talk to us about your approach to partnership and how do you look at, at strategic partnerships? Yeah, uh, certainly. So we look at partnerships, uh, you know, one by one, obviously. We look for really two things in particular. One is there a strategic fit. Uh, so I think as, as Dave on the last panel alluded to, you know, our brand is going to have regional areas of focus. A lot of those uh, you know, regional points of strength will be around where there's an MGM property. So Michigan, Las Vegas, et cetera. Um, so there's certainly a strategic, uh, strategic importance to all the things that we do. But I think more importantly, as we get into discussions with a team, it's very evident which teams are entrepreneurial from a culture perspective, which teams are performance driven and want to go say above and beyond um, what uh, is in the, in the written um, form of the contract. And, you know, I think it's that cultural fit and that ability to deliver on behalf of our brand is what we probably end up, um, you know, using as our primary factor in determining partnerships. I think in the three in the three groups here, you know, the NBA Action and Yahoo, we we have um, incredible working relationships. Uh, you know, weekly if not daily calls with each of them, joint um, product development sessions, engineers talking to engineers, et cetera. It's um, it's really uh, really exciting to see how the partnerships have evolved. Amazing. Scott, you made an interesting comment a minute ago about meeting fans where they are. So how do you pick partners to help you meet fans where they are? Yeah, no, I, it's a good question. And I think it really informs what our partnership strategy is. You know, it, we, we took the approach in sports betting to partner with everyone. Um, and, you know, historically, the NBA in a traditional sponsorship category, you know, we have an exclusive insurance partner in State Farm and an exclusive autos partner in Kia. But since sports betting is becoming a bigger part of the fan experience on the NBA, we mm -hmm. didn't think it was appropriate to pick one partner. And we felt we wanted to make sure all of the legal licensed operators had the tools to create a best in class experience and an authentic product. So, you know, I think day one, the obvious things are licensing the, the official data feed so that operators, you know, have the have real time stats. Um, they can update odds in real time. They can facilitate a positive in-play betting experience. They can open up more markets because we have a more robust data set. Um, you know, licensing our marks and logos so you can create a more authentic looking product. You right. know, you go into Vegas, you know, 10, 15 years ago and it's CLE versus DAL pro basketball championship. You know, that's not the type of experience our fans want. You know, and I always use the example, our fans don't wear generic orange and blue t-shirts. They wear Knicks t-shirts. They don't play basketball 2020. They play NBA 2K. Right. And so similarly, I think they want that authentic experience. So that is why we chose to do things non-exclusively so we could work with everyone in the industry and give them the tools to create that experience. 
And then I think the next step is, well, with some of those deeper partnerships, I mean, all partnerships aren't created equal. MGM is our official partner and we're much closer to them than others, is with those deeper partners, how do we actually work together to rethink the future of the betting experience? And as, as betting behavior changes, as people think about betting on micro bets and the next the next shot and the next three pointer, what should that look like from the NBA? How do you build that experience? You know, do fans want like a live graphic of the court and be able to push a, you know, say, I, I think they're gonna hit a quarter three as the next shot. How do right. we build that type of interactive engaging experience? And, and I think that's where we'll get to over the next few years as the sports betting industry unfolds. Speaking of not going exclusive, Ari, you and the action sports, the action network, you've gone with sort of more of a comparison tool and not necessarily a particular uh, exclusive. Can you talk to us a little bit about your strategy and why you decided not go with a, an exclusive betting operator, but more of a tool approach? Sure. Before I go down any rabbit holes, all the words coming through clearly? Yes, they're amazing. Right. If you could just long Kelly your microphone, my day would be perfect. <laughs> So um, I think it's probably three reasons. One is just practicality for our business model. We're, we're you know, we have two primary revenue, stream, revenue streams. One is a subscription business. The other is an affiliate business. And I think in an affiliate business, the key is having an industry that is pretty fragmented supply. And there's a, there's a lot of operators in the space and a lot of, of users kind of looking where they, they want to bet. And for an affiliate business to work, we, we need to be able to serve all those partners. Now, I think we we certainly do quote unquote super affiliate type deals, and, and there's certain operators, particularly those that will lean in with, as I've said, we're a content company and a product company. If you will lean into us and help ameliorate our, our content and ameliorate our product, we will typically give that operator a bigger share of voice because it, it's a better service to our customers. I think MGM is a, a perfect example of that, and we have this technology called BetSync where you. You can track your bet in the Action Network app, but if you connect your BetMGM account with your Action account, it actually syncs it automatically. Um, so that's a, a real value add to the to the consumer and why we would you know, lean towards it, BetMGM in certain ways. But as a whole, practically speaking, for our business model to function, we, we, we do need to kind of service multiple operators. I think the second is, is a, a bit of a credibility standpoint. Mm -hmm. I think the Action Network is an independent voice um, kind of telling people, giving people content on where to bed. And I think if we were exclusively tied to one operator, there's a little bit of like, well, are they really just trying to drive, you know, the bottom line of that operator? Sure. And then I think the third is utility, um, which is sometimes the best way to bet is to find the best line available. Similar to when you're, you're shopping on kayak, you're trying to find the best flight at the best price. Sometimes, we, we may, as I've said, lean in with BetMGM at times, but if they have, they have a spread at plus seven and someone else has it at plus nine, that, that's seriously different value for our users to take advantage of. And, and that's something we have to service that audience with, both in general for Audius as well as for our subscription products. Gotcha. As far as Matt, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the Yahoo and BetMGA, M, sorry, BetMGM collaborations. So and maybe as far as you can kick it off and love to hear from you and Matt on this. Yeah, sure. So yeah. this all, you know, we actually signed this deal about a year ago. So we as Yahoo Sports and Verizon, you know, spent a long time thinking about this. We knew given our fantasy audience and given the, you know, 70-ish million people we have coming to our site every month that we wanted to be in this space. And we took some time. We got, we talked to many of the people on this panel, got to know the industry, got to know the space. But ultimately the reason we picked Matt and Bet MGM was for a few things. One, you know, market access, the great market access they have via their physical footprint, the technology that they bring. You know, we want to make sure that our users have a wonderful user experience. Um, there are so many things that MGM and Verizon and GVC can do together in the technology space. Um, we're hoping once the world returns to a more normal space that we can do events and we can film productions on site at places like the Bellagio. Um, they have great league, league relationships like we do too. So when Matt and I can both go to Scott and say, hey, we want to do something together with you, it makes it that much better. And we're doing that with multiple other leagues as well, um, with the NHL and which M with MLB as well. Um, you know, two more things. One, I think, you know, as many people have said so far, there are a lot of players in this space. There won't be this many betting operators in this space in five years. And we wanted to pick a partner that would win. Um, but lastly, you know, having grown up in consulting, I think people often underestimate when they look at a deal sort of the importance of cultural fit and actually liking one another. And we really, we really like the people at MGM and we work together well, you know, 
I do partnerships all day, but a good partnership means that you actually don't have to look at the contract very often, that you're both working together to build something good for each company and for the fans, most importantly. That's a great lead in for Matt, because you talked about working with entrepreneurial partners. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think, it, you know, a big part of, you know, in addition to all the things as Warra mentioned, is a big part of what we do is have a shared product vision. So ultimately, the, the strategy on the part of Yahoo was, we want to essentially have the betting experience be integrated fully into the actual digital experience on Yahoo. And that involves a lot of product development. So we actually, we took Yahoo engineering resources and actually flew them to Hyderabad, India to meet with our development team, which is all based in India. So there, there's, a, there's a deep working relationship, not only at the commercial level, but also really where, frankly, where it matters most, which is at the technical level. And, and you, you've seen a lot of integrations. If you followed Yahoo Sports or Yahoo Sportsbook, you've seen a lot of integrations land in the last few months, and you'll probably see some more in the future. Amazing. I'd love to throw a question out to all of you to, to tackle, and I don't know who wants to go first, but you know, a lot of our audience today comes from the partnership side, the corporate sponsorship side, and um, it is different, as Scott mentioned, not necessarily the same exclusivities, but how can brands get involved? What are the right opportunities for them to consider and, and maybe some thoughts on the future of brand partnerships? And Mary, do you mind kicking this off for us? In terms of brand partnerships, you, do you mean BetMGM as a brand with action or brands outside of the sports betting space? Let's maybe start with non-endemics because I think yeah, that's probably so the, the, harder, the harder one to crack. So for, for us, you know, it's, it's an area, as, we, as I was talking about the, the two primary revenue streams, most people probably noticed that I, I didn't mention advertising as, as one of the things we do. And that's, again, largely because we had historically been a, a paywalled um, content provider. As we've moved away from that and our audience has, has exploded, uh, we are definitely exploring the ways in which we would in, integrate other brands into our content and onto our platform. And I think for brands, it's interesting because this is not a, this is a, this is a very, this is a very affluent demo, right? Someone who is willing to take out their credit card and put money down on a game as an entertainment product is a consumer of, of many digital, of many goods through e-commerce. And so it's, it's a very valuable market to go after. For us, programmatic advertising, we still worry about it being like, do we want to just slap ads on our platform? Or would we want to, like, like we, we do tons of content at, that we could have sponsored specifically by certain partners where we think that would, again, ameliorate the content we're offering. So we're, 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 we're definitely looking at that closely. And I think brands should, should definitely be very interested in this space because these are consumers. And I think the NBA knows this very well. These are a very, this is the market that they definitely want their audiences to be gravitating towards. I think one interesting antidote from the, from the betting side, our traffic during the election was gangbusters, like <laughs> compared to uh, outdid any Super Bowl by a mile. Yeah. And the reason for that was we ranked very high for presidential odds and we have a, we had a live odds tracker during, during that. And there's no legal betting market for that in the United States. And I had friends who aren't even sports fans texting me about it. So what I saw was we saw millions of people coming onto our platform with no interest in betting, just because of what the betting psychology can tell you about real world events. That as the odds are shifting, as people are making bigger bets in the European books, what do these smarter people know that is going to shift the outcome of this election? And quickly, you saw suddenly Pennsylvania was shifting entirely to Biden's favor. Georgia, same thing. And it, and it, it was really interesting how non-betters were so captivated with how the betting market could influence what they were doing. And I think that that tells you that there is a much bigger audience for, for the, the content around this industry. Um, as tempted as I am to go there, I'm going to skip back to sponsorship and sports um, because otherwise I'll start asking for odds on lawsuits. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Scott, Ari talked about that this is an affluent fan. It's also a highly engaged fan. So when you think about the NBA or masters of working with corporate partners, what conversations are they having uh, with you and what conversations are you having with them? And, what guidance are you giving? Yeah, it, it's a great point. And I think to Ari's point, there are brands that are really interested in this category. And then there are brands that don't want to touch this category with a 10 foot pole. Right. And, and I think it's really about sorting through that. You know, of course, this is a, a demographic that has to be over 21. So anyone who has a youth focused initiative, you know, it's probably not the right fit for. 
but there are other, are other partners that we're discussing that this is very much a part of the fan experience. So perfect example, we, we have a free to play game ecosystem called NBA Pick'em and uh, Michelob Ultra is sponsoring our draft challenge. And, right. and if you think about that, you know, look, the fan experience, betting and drinking beer kind of go together in, in, in quite a big way. And so there's obviously a lot of overlap and obviously those are both demographics where you need to be over 21, both from actually and the way that you market to folks. So there, there are certain of those categories where this is a really interesting way to engage, uh, to engage your fans. And, um, you know, 47 brand, for example, is another uh, one of our brands that is sponsored our free to play games and gave away hats and gear. Again, that is a lot of who they are targeting with their specific brand. Um, you know, I'll let Ashwara talk to it, but I'm mean, sorry, rather uh, Matt talk to it, but that MGM and Buffalo Wild Wings have partnered and they're, uh, they're a partner that has looked at the experience and wow, fans coming into our buildings and watching games and, and betting on games. That's a huge part of what we're trying to build at Buffalo Wild Wings. So I think there are those, those series of partners that are really interested in the space that I think are trying to figure out where is betting maybe an extension of their business and how do they use betting as a way to amplify the services or the goods that they're um, that they're selling and there are some natural fits there but it's important not to say you know exxon mobile should be engaging in the category or, or someone like that where it's you know maybe not as intuitive and i know it's early for you in vegas but it's almost lunchtime for me here in toronto and scott just made me hungry at buffalo wild wings so maybe you could talk a little bit more about about that and and other counsel you would give to a, a brand around the sports betting area Look, I, again, I think what we're trying to do, generally speaking, is create experiences, whether those are digital or physical or the intersection of, of both. And um, for brands that are interested in this category and brands that are potentially interested in working with us, a big piece of that, a big piece of our evaluation process is going to be how well can those brands help us engage with consumers? Okay. And we've We've just started um, with Yahoo, with Action, um, our approach in the world of content uh, specifically. I think we'll continue to make investments in uh, in content that's relevant to our category. So brands that have perhaps um, a strong following with an audience that might offer perspective um, would be a, of interest to us. Um, and anything that you know connects this physical world into the digital world. So Wild Wings is a great example. A lot of the things we're trying to do with Yahoo once the world returns to normal is in this um, intersection of, of digital and physical um, experiences. Amazing. Shwara, can you talk to me a little bit about how you guys look at making sports betting really the, the social experience and, and um, what's your approach to that? And is this something you, you see as a big emphasis going forward? Yeah, you were nice enough to show our sizzle reel earlier, which always makes me smile because really sports is supposed to be fun, right? I mean, we're all really fortunate to get to work in sports and many of us to work in the sports betting space. So our mission is to make sports fun for people. Um, you know, and also a lot of what you saw in the reels, it's our, one of our big goals and it will con you'll continue to see more of it going forward just to make sports and sports betting more diverse and more inclusive and more welcoming of everyone. So those are two of the big missions you'll see going forward for us. Um, we televised an event with the Women's Sports Foundation last month. Um, but broadly, I mean, for example, for us, why do people play fantasy? People play fantasy because it's fun, but more than anything, they play because it's social. It's fun to say that I beat the head of Yahoo sports product last week in fantasy, which is amazing because he actually built the game. So I take a lot of excitement and pride in that. And you know, maybe this week I'll beat my boss, you know, like we don't know. I mean, but right. it's not fun to play in a vacuum. And we want to take some of those learnings we have from fantasy and bring them into betting as well. Make it a fun, make it a social experience. One thing we launched this year with the NFL was watch together. So you can watch an NFL game and video conference with your friends. I tried it a few weeks ago with my dad. We watched the Chargers game together from 3000 miles away. So how can you incorporate that into fantasy drafts and into betting in the future? Let me guess, the Chargers blew it in the fourth quarter. Ah, oh, next year's going to be great. You just keep saying that when you grow up yeah. in a small market. Next year's going to be great. Or just get the rules changed. Make it a five-quarter game. The Chargers would be amazing. Or a three-quarter three -quarter game. game, maybe. Yeah. Um, look, I'm going to invite uh, uh, Brian and Matthew back and Kelly by phone. Unfortunately, we lost David to something urgent, but I've got a, a, a big trove of questions here. So uh, uh, looks like we're doing well here. So I'm going to um, throw some out there, and some of them might be uh, more... Um, generic and, and I'll let whoever wants to take them on but let's just start from the top here um, 
All right, where should we go? For either David, Brian, or Kelly, somebody is actually taking over my role of moderator, which is great. This is a long question. Could you talk about cross-sell from a numbers point of view? And I know today we're not necessarily gonna share anything confidential, but maybe just talk about cross-sell. Um, there's three more questions to this question, but I'm gonna make it simple. If you could really talk a little bit about cross-sell. Uh, Brian, David, Kelly, maybe I'll get all three of you to answer. You know what they mean by cross-sell? Adil, what do you mean by cross-sell? <laughs> <laughs> I think I could probably hop in if you guys can hear me on that yeah. one. Um, so FanDuel Group has uh, four product lines under multiple, even more brands. Um, so there's DFS and Daily Fantasy in the cross sell from there into Sportsbook. And then from Sportsbook, we cross sell into racing. And then there's, uh, sorry, from Sportsbook into Casino. And then <laughs> there's also, you know, inroads from, from DFS into racing and whatnot. So um, from a FanDuel Group perspective, cross-sell is something that we consider imperative to our business. We think it's one of our huge advantages in the, the industry. Um, and like all of those types of products kind of have natural overlaps, but some are a lot, lot bigger than others. So I, I think I mentioned earlier how DFS um, being sports uh, endemic is, has, a, has a very large uh, cross-sell or overlap in audience, if you will, with, with Sportsbook. Um, and the economics, are, are great once you start getting people using the whole ecosystem. Like casino is so much lesser known. And so uh, it, it's not, or I casino, I should say, is not as broadly reaching yet, but in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, the numbers on casino and, and the margins there are higher than sports betting. <laughs> um, so if you can get someone who is interested in sports betting also taking a crack at, you know, live dealer blackjack or roulette or something like that, it's the, the not only is their experience richer and deeper with FanDuel, but um, from, a, from a business perspective, it's, it's fantastic. So we have, you know, within my own team, we have dedicated resource who all they, all they are thinking about all day, every day is how do we get customers to engage with more than just one of our products on FanDuel. Gotcha. Ryan, do you want to take, take that one? Yeah, I mean, we're at Betfred, we're in the US at least, we're, we're sports betting only. So I, I wish I had Kelly's uh, fantasy audience to start with. That would be fantastic. Um, so we, we don't do cross sale here, but obviously, um, as you know, our, our goal, like, you know, Kelly mentioned it, that online casino, as much as I love sports and much as I love sports betting, online casino is infinitely more profitable. Um, it's the same reason why you walk into the casino here in Vegas and you, and then, you know, the whole, the whole floor is covered in slot machines. There's a reason for that slot machines are significantly more profitable for the casino. So, you know, ultimately I, I would love to see states uh, regulate and, and pass sports betting and, and I gaming at the same time, because I think that that's great for everyone. It's great for consumers. It's great for operators. It's great for advertising. It's good, it's good for everyone. Awesome. Some of the questions are coming through in the chat. If you can move them to the Q and A, great. If you put up in the chat, I'm going to not get to your questions. I'm just going to throw that out there. Here's a bit of a loaded one um, because I know who wrote the question. And, uh, but the question is, amateur sport is the incubator for developing athletes and coaches who are essential to the sports industry. I edited his wording. Um, how is the industry giving back to amateur sport? Not an easy question. So the question is, you know, given where coaches and athletes come from, any thoughts from a perspective of, is the sports betting industry giving back to amateur sport? I'll go ahead and take this one, Mark. And if you look at the deal that the University of Colorado just signed with PointsBet, you know, for so long, um, the amateur athletics has stayed shied away from uh, sports betting advertisement and partnerships. And I think Colorado sort of broke down that barrier with the points bet deal. And now it's actually an, an additional revenue stream, especially at a time post COVID where so many schools, 352 of them to be exact D one schools didn't get their March madness money and their budgets are just decimated uh, during the COVID time. Suddenly these corporate partnerships are actually actually going to float some of these athletic budgets uh, to allow some of these amateur athletic sports that don't make money to continue. And, and at the end of the day, what are we trying to do now? So 
more and more of these sports are on TV and on streaming networks. And we already talked about people are eight to 10 times more likely to watch an event if they have a wager on it. So now people make wagers on these events and then they go and find these streaming networks. They find these cheaper pay-per-views for these collegiate athletics. And it's been shown that if you make a bet on an event, so I'm making a bet on a college event, I watch it, I have a positive experience, it was fun, I enjoyed it. Now I'm more likely to watch that collegiate event in the future, maybe purchase tickets, maybe even purchase merchandise. Anybody else want to jump on that one? I mean, I would agree. I mean, I think it's one of those high tide raises all boats. Uh, when there's right. more engagement in a, in a sport, there's going to be more of an audience, there's going to be more money for everyone on tickets and, and TV and revenue and all that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, I would love to get more involved with with various uh, universities, but you know, the NCAA sort of has a, you know, love-hate relationship with the, with, the, with the betting industry, even though as much as great as March Madness is, it would not be near as big without, without sports betting. But so far the NCAA really isn't there yet. Um, and I think we're all, at least I, I, I would love to get more involved, but so far the NCAA is, is not a huge fan. Well, that's an easy layup, no pun intended, for the next question I'm going to ask, which is, and Matthew, I, I suspect you're going to want to lead on this, but I'd love for everybody's thoughts. So the question is, in broad strokes, what does the sports betting industry do to prevent, in quotes, nefarious activity, i.e. athletes throwing games and prevent gambler addiction? So I think that's right up your alley first, Matthew, and but love everybody else's thoughts. Sure. So for us, it starts with the that with the convergence we talked about earlier. The fact that we the regulators, the operators, and the leagues, teams, and universities all work together. And then second, you know, the point we brought up earlier about transitioning people from the uh, illegal market to the regulated sports betting market gives us transparency into what's being wagered, where it's being wagered from, who's making those wagers. Do they have any p potential connections to the people on the team? We, you know, one of the most common things we deal with is potential misuse of insider information. And the teams understand that that's how it starts. The fact that a player or a coach or an equipment manager is being offered a couple thousand dollars to divulge locker room information that later on those same betting groups are the people who are going to approach that individual to say, hey, you want to make a lot of money, help me get these players on board for, on board for point shaving or match fixing. But it, you know, the first way we combat it is to cooperate and collaborate. The fact that all these industries are in it together, the operators are amazing. They don't want point shaving. They don't want match fixing. They don't want corruption in sport. You know, uh, the regulators don't want corruption in sport. So as we transition people to the regulated space, we get access to data, just like in the financial services world. Think back to Wall Street in the late 80s, early 90s, fraught with insider information. People didn't trust it. They put e-trading in place. The technology got better. And then they put regulations in place to share data. What happens? More people are trading on the stock market than ever in the history of the country. Same thing in sports betting. We have better data sharing, better transparency, and all sides cooperating together. And that's what we're doing to combat nefarious activity. Awesome. Yeah, I think, yeah. look, from my, yeah, my perspective, this, is a, uh, this we can learn from our, our UK counterparts uh, in terms of how um, how responsible gaming evolved in that market um, in particular. Uh, you know, while there's a euphoria around sports betting at the moment, and there will be for some time, um, you know, I agree with Dave's assessment. You know, we as an industry need to be um, very responsible. This is one of the, this area of responsible gaming in particular is one of the reasons why you should bet with a fully legal operator and not bet offshore. And that's a big part of our growth. And I think as the, as the space evolves, this is going to be increasingly more and more important. And, and I would just add that this, this point right here is why our commissioner wrote the op-ed in 2014, right? I mean, protecting the integrity of our games is at the center of this. And it became clear that we were in a better position to protect the integrity of our games with a regulated market that has transparency where we have access to the information, we have access to the tools to help us to do so. And, and one of the many reasons we decided to do these non-exclusive partnerships is because each of our deals involves information sharing. So the operators as part of our commercial deals are required to give us anonymized bet level data so that we can also be monitoring the activity in our games. And, and I agree with what Matt said, you know, I think 
early on, there was some confusion that we that the leagues were going to play the role of regulators. But the reality is that everyone has blind spots, you know, and there are things that the leagues have purview into that the regulators don't and that the operators don't and vice versa in each direction. So we all need to be working together so that we can spot trends that may not seem problematic to one party, but when coupled with other information that you see, certainly could be. So we are investing quite a bit of money in, an, in a monitoring system to help us track that information and put to use the data that our operator partners give us um, so that we can make sure that we can spot anything um, that is problematic you know, immediately and, and prevent anything that looks suspicious. Great. Um, a domestic question here from our Canadian audience, just about the fact that there is currently a bill in front of our, our federal government to allow single game betting. Any thoughts on uh, what that impact will have for Canada and, and your thoughts in terms of, of our market up here north of the 49th, where we are not taking any uh, immigration right now, uh, just for the record, until next January. I promise not to get political. Maybe right. is the... Am I the lone Canadian panelist? You are. So, um, I, I saw the news on that recently. Uh, and sorry, when I was at, at FanDuel and um, Scott knows, that Scott and I were actually just having a funny debate, nerdy debate about which state capitals are the least enjoyable to visit um, <laughs> in the legislative. Pro but so it's the amount of questions we get around what's happening in a state legislature. It's it's a lot of it is so hard to predict and so hard mm -hmm. to know. Um, I think if Canada were to follow a allow single game wagering, Ontario is a, a sports hungry and as big as any as you know any of the of the, the five largest states are. So it would it would it would be a serious boost there. It's it's so hard to predict as it is with all the lobbyists and, and counsel we work with in the US, what's happening in, in the legislative process here. And as soon as I saw that question and started immediately getting questions about the Canadian le legislative process, I was like, I, I'm hopeful, but it, it's just so hard to predict, but um, it would be great to see. The, the other thing that's just really funny and you know, we, we've been involved a little bit and our commissioner has put out a statement of support um, and the owner of the Raptors, Larry Tannenbaum has, has played a, an integral role in that process. But what's amazing, you know, for those of you who aren't as close to state legislatures and what happens, this would require a one sentence change in Canada's criminal code. Uh, literally, that's all that would have to happen to legalize uh, sports betting. But of course, it gets tied up in broader politics of which side wants it and which doesn't and what can you get for it and who can do it. And, and so, but literally, it's a one sentence change to Canada's criminal code is all that's needed to legalize single event sports betting. I learned, I actually thought Drake on the Raptors, so I'm glad I came to this webinar today. Um, I learned something. This is a question for all of you. I think it's, you know, from, from Ms., Mr. or Ms. Anonymous here, but I think it's an amazing, uh, uh, I'm sure you're seeing this in many ways. What's the impact of sports betting on the future of sports rights? I'm assuming they mean broadcast rights. So Ishwara, do you want to take that first? But I'd love to hear from all of you on this one because I, I think it's pretty needy. Yeah, I mean, I think it harkens back to one thing people have talked about earlier, and I think Scott talked about this. I think that the future will be you see streams of games, and you're starting to see this already, where there are different streams for different types of users. You might see the future where there's not only an overlay that targets fantasy users or DFS users or betting users. I think you've already seen that with what Amazon does with, on Thursday, Thursday nights, which I think is really great. You saw it with the BetCast that many of us partnered with the NBA to do. Um, for sure, you know, more engagement is certainly good for sports betting rights, maybe less good for those of us who, who pay for them. But also, um, sorry, I have to say that. Um, but I think what's interesting is that you're also going to see that it's also going to become something that broadcasters and other media rights holders expect to be able to get as part of their rights too. So yes, it is something people are going to want, but it's also going to become an increasing expectation of both fans and media holders that we can serve fans in the way they want with more of a customized feed. Yeah, and I, I would add, listen, I think we certainly agree that you know, the engagement benefits that accrue in theory would help us uh, increase the value of our rights and more time spent viewing will be helpful and, and a new engaged category. But I think it's really important to use this question as the time to say we also have to be really careful. Um, and once again, using the UK and Australia and Italy as a, as a, as a test case is 
when you go too far and you have every other advertising be sports betting and the entire telecast becomes about sports betting, that's when these massive overcorrections happen. And so, you know, while th there's no question it's an opportunity and there's no question there's engagement benefits, but we really have to strike that right balance. And that's why, you know, we like this notion of an alternate telecast. That is something the fans are raising their hands. They're saying, this is what I want. This is how I want to consume the game. And I think we can go much wider and deeper on that. But if you look in our traditional telecast, we have not yet integrated odds into our telecast. We've limited the amount of sports betting inventory because we're really trying to avoid those overcorrections. And, you know, you get to a point where, sure, incrementally it can help the value of sports rights. But if one of those overcorrections come, then maybe it doesn't. So we really have to be careful and diligent and thoughtful in the way that we roll this out and make sure this opportunity is being is being exploited responsibly and that we don't basically ruin it for everyone, you know, business folks and fans. I'm gonna throw it to Kelly because she's probably feeling like the pre-COVID meeting where everybody's in a boardroom together and she's the one person calling in on the phone that gets ignored because I can't see her. So Kelly, your thoughts on this, hope, hope you're still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Yeah, I mean, I think those are both really good points. Um, and we all need to be responsible about this. And certainly, um, if most of the audiences in Canada, they probably have not had uh, been inundated with all the sports betting ads that are, are coming across in the US. So it's certainly something on our mind. And that's why also we're looking to do more, you know, fewer but better integrations. And, you know, we partner with with Scott and, and others to, to do achieve that. So, you know, less about offers and make your bet right now and, and just more about kind of like passively including lines and things like that. Um, we're also leaning in uh, pretty hard on free to play on the FanDuel side um, to kind of offer up a different way to engage with the game that, you know, it's akin to betting, but it's not so in your face about you know, real money, uh, real action type of messages. You know, the, the audience of, you know, we, we take responsible gaming incredibly seriously, um, not only, you know, in terms of keeping people safe and the amounts they're betting and whatnot, but, you know, we also have to think about the fact that sports audiences are not just folks above the age of 21. So, um, yeah, you know, I think we'll continue to see it evolve. Um, I 100% agree, though, that we all need to be responsible uh, as an industry, um, both as sports betting industry and, and the sports industry in general, uh, in terms of how we roll that out so that we don't overstep. Any other thoughts on the impact of sports betting on media rights? Uh, I've got an important question here, though, from somebody who wants to know Alvin Kamara or Dalvin Cook, full PPR, rest of the season, who wants to tackle that one? Um, if someone gives me three minutes, I'll get back to that question. Let me get a real expert. <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. That's what I was thinking, too. <laughs> I'm like, nobody wants my tips, trust me. <laughs> Um, let's talk a little bit about technologies. And Scott, I know I'm losing you in like 31 seconds. So I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, which new technologies do you see having the greatest impact on better acquisition? Sure. Um, well, I, I don't know about better acquisition, but I think uh, I'll give you the one that I think is the most important, and that okay. is reducing latency in streaming. Um, okay. I, I think there is going to be an enormous opportunity to integrate digital content with sports betting. And right now, um, the, the delays that happen on streaming platforms, even the best streaming platforms, are, are simply far too long uh, for, for sports betting purposes. And so as new technologies come out that re reduce the latency of streaming, we're able to integrate the content experience from the betting experience. Right now, the betting experience is a second screen activity. You know, you've got your phone and you're watching on your other in your linear television or on a connected device. Um, but I think there's gonna be an opportunity for those things to converge into one integrated experience and reducing latency in broadcast. We, we've solved latency in, in betting, or at least in our data feed. You know, that's not the issue. The issue is now the telecast itself and not seeing your odds update 10 seconds before you see what happens in the game. Um, so, so that I think is the, is the, the top technological advancement we need to see to really unlock a lot of potential in the category. And, and with that, I, I'm going, I'm going to, to duck out and, and try to leave on a high note. You got to run, you got five and a half weeks for a new season. So we'll see. Yeah, you. exactly. Thanks, Ryan, Ryan. Your, your thoughts on technology. Thanks, Scott. Um, no, you know, Scott makes up a, Scott brings up a great point. So I, I, I completely agree with him. I think on, on another side is just the, on the data side, you know, as a, there, there are companies like Swish Analytics that are doing really awesome things where, with, that allow you to do different player props and allow 
allow players to, to build in-game parlays, um, same game parlays based on player props, but something that's also, you know, in, in, a, in a pricing methodology, it's also good for the, for the operator. So those, I think there will be continue to be uh, <clears throat> different technologies that allow that to get more granular and allow us to offer, you know, more uh, options to the sports betters, allow them to combine various options. I think that's, that's good for everyone. Matt, I'm going to have you go next, but somebody's added to this question about the, the whole concept of wearables as well. So I don't know if anyone wants to tackle that because, you know, interesting, you know, athlete biometric data, is that something that can yeah, come so, to play? Um, you know, from a tech perspective, I agree with Scott uh, that one of the areas is around, is around latency as we think about things like mark, micro betting, where you're betting on the next action um, that really requires the betting platform to be fully in sync with, uh, with the telecast. And, and at the moment, the idea of betting on something like next pitch or next golf shot or something like that is really difficult because of the, the inherent latency. Um, the other one, candidly, is, is more in the back office, maybe not as exposed to consumers per se, but as, as we as operators have to maintain a regulatory framework in each and every state uh -huh. that that ability when the world returns to normal when we've got people crossing uh, state lines on a regular basis delivering a consistent experience as a brand across states with a lot of the complexity hidden to the user is a big technical challenge it's not um, something we we go out and communicate but there's a there's a lot of detail to work out to make sure that we are fully compliant with all the individual state regulations and deliver a seamless consumer experience. And not to put you in the spot, but would you say that's the number one industry challenge? It's, I don't know what the number one, industry, <laughs> it's the number one industry channel challenge is, but it's, it's, um, it, it is a challenge. And, and, you know, to the, again, to Dave's point earlier, uh, you've got a lot of individual regulatory um, bodies to, to work with. And there's different reporting requirements and, and all that complexity needs to be hidden to the user. Gotcha. Uh, anybody else on technology? I would just say, you know, one of the things that we at Verizon are doing, are, we're actually installing 5G in a ton of stadiums. We've installed it in a bunch of NFL stadiums and you're gonna see it continue to um, launch in NHL stadiums, for example, this year. It'll enable you to do things, to tie back to the wearables, you know, we're partnering with some major new innovative technology companies to enable data collection to be faster as well. It'll enable a few different things. Data collection will be faster. So what happened in the play, right. you know, the feed will become faster. And then it'll also become a better user experience for fans in the stadium, both for just, you know, posting on social media, but also for betting in play once that comes back and people can go back into stadiums more frequently. So I'm getting red carded here, which means I have less than 60 seconds. So I'm going to apologize. I didn't get to everybody in that last question, but I, I want to thank you for being part of today's panel and, and dealing with All right, Just because I, I owe the answer. It was Dalvin Cook. Oh, thank you. But it's very right. uh, My friend David from Vancouver asked that question. So, so uh, you owe one, DSH. Um, Dalvin Cook, notwithstanding. Um, Thank you very much for being part of our panel and, and obviously some of the technology challenges. Uh, I'm sure there's a ton of questions here. I'm sure you're gonna get a ton of LinkedIn's today and more follow up, but be safe. Have a great Thursday. Go Steelers. Thanks, Thanks Mark. Thanks everyone. Uh, Thanks just, guys. <laughs> just to give people a quick update coming uh, up, our next panel will be on December 1st. Uh, where we'll be talking about champions of change on the global day of giving. We look forward to having you there. Please join us. Don't forget, uh, if you want to watch the entire webinar and you missed part of it, go to the Sponsor Talks website and um, love to hear from you as well and get your feedback. Be safe. Happy November. <laughs>